Our world is full of incredible happenings, from natural wonders to impossible discoveries to incredible feats of human imagination. Every day it seems that something even more beautiful, proving that the sky really is the limit with regards to what is achievable, as well as what might lie right beneath our noses. Some of these discoveries are of mysterious origin, others are simply inconceivable, but all of them are equally as amazing. So today, we'll be taking a look at three stories and discoveries that have left everybody baffled. Man buries buses. Every now and again, society produces a visionary who is capable of viewing the future in unprecedented and unique ways. This was certainly the case with Canadian Bruce Beach. Beach lived through the Vietnam and Cold Wars, with the fear and insecurity that these events precipitated, and these experiences directly impacted his decisions as he sought out a safer beach purchased 42 school buses, heavily desirable for their sturdy construction, able to withstand heavy overhead loads, and almost 13 acres of land in Canada. After hiring an army of workers who dug a pit large and deep enough to hold all 42 buses, Beach strategically placed the buses in the pit, connecting them into a complex metal maze. With the vision of creating an underground, bunker-style compound that would allow beach or cataclysmic event. The buses were covered in two feet of concrete, followed by an astonishing 14 feet of dirt, sealing the compound underground and ensuring those buses would never see the light of day. The entire operation was so extensive that Beach High had the same structural engineer that created the Toronto subway system to oversee the massive project and ensure the structure would be able to withstand not only the weight of the concrete and dirt, but also atomic blasts and other catastrophes. The final compound is incredibly massive and comes in at over 1,000 square feet of totally atomic blast-proof space. The construction is not yet complete and likely won't be finished in Beecher's lifetime, as there will always be amendments and modifications in such an enormous one-of-a-kind space. Fittingly dubbed Ark II, in a nod to the biblical vessel that saved Noah, his family and the animals from a catastrophic flood, the bunker can comfortably house and protect up to 500 people and boasts of being one of the largest underground structures in North America. An enormous amount of labor is required to continue the construction of Arc 2, which can get extremely expensive in an ongoing continuous project such as this. From planning to labor, maintenance to renovations, Beach was required to get creative with solutions in order to be able to accomplish these necessary tasks without breaking the bank. His solution was to offer guaranteed admission to Arc 2 in the event of a nuclear situation or catastrophe, to anyone from the nearby towns who volunteers at the site for a couple of weekends a year. This incentivized over 50 locals who considered it a small price to pay for safety in an event of world collapse. Featuring a decontamination chamber for both people and goods, basic fatalities, fuel, and its own potable water well. As well as rooms such as a doctor and dentist offices, library, mortuary, day room, chapel, nursery, gyms, and playgrounds. Beach has ensured that moving underground in the face of a nuclear attack will not be uncomfortable in the slightest, and that the human race will be able to comfortably continue if forced to move underground. Michigan Mammoth Discovery The farmer's life is not an easy one, and requires hours of toil to overcome the many obstacles that nature puts in his way. Yet nature had a little something special in store for a farmer outside of Chelsea, Michigan. As James Bristle and a neighbor were digging to install the drainage pipe in his wheat field, they encountered an obstacle too hard for even their backhoe to remove. Upon closer investigation, the offending object was revealed to be nothing other than a massive bone that appeared to be at least three feet long and much bigger than any bone either man had ever seen before. Luckily, the University of Michigan Museum of Paleontology is located a mere ten miles from the site of discovery, and Bristle, suspected he'd stumbled upon a gigantic dinosaur bone, asked him to come out and take a look at what he had uncovered. Daniel Fisher, the director, along with a team of 15 students quickly arrived at the site and began uncovering what was quickly identified as the bones of a prehistoric mammoth. Although the team had to work quickly due to the tight harvest schedule and Bristle needed to have his field restored to him within a day so that he could continue the drainage pipe, they were still able to excavate the bones as well as form several conclusions based off of their placement. By the end of the project, they were able to recover the skull, the tusks, the vertebrae, the ribs, pelvis, and shoulder blades from the wheat field. These were all transported back to the university for further analysis. Identified as a Jeffersonian mammoth, the placement of the vertebrae, 
along with several possible tools found nearby, indicates the beast was likely butchered by early humans in the area and submerged in a pond for preservation of the meat. As this mammoth lived probably between 11,715,000 years ago, this new information pushes back the estimated date of human habitation of the Michigan region of the United States by several hundred years. Amazingly, though these mammals were relatively common until their extinction 11,000 years ago, only 30 skeletons have been found in the region. Less than five of this number were as complete as the one excavated from the wheat field and he's glad that he was able to contribute to such groundbreaking research in such a unique way. But he says that he hopes it doesn't happen again. After all, the harvest waits for no man, nor mama. Dutchman Build's life-size Noah's Arkansas Bruce Beach is not the only one to attempt to build a second ark. In fact, someone is taking it one step further and built almost an exact replica of the boat recorded in the Hebrew Bible. Jahan Hubers has been fascinated with creating a replica of the Ark since 1993. He was inspired while reading a bedtime story about Noah and his miraculous boat to his children one night. His family and friends thought he was joking until 2006, when, after years of planning, he built a half-scale replica that was able to sail the canals of his native Netherlands. However, this smaller but impressive model didn't satisfy him for long. He sold it so that he could go all out and make an exact replica of the biblical ark. This was, quite literally, no small feat, as the completed ark is 75 feet tall, comparable to the height of a five-story building. 95 feet wide, 410 feet long, and weighs over 2,500 tons. Built from steel barge framing and enough wood to equate to 12,000 large trees, the Ark is larger than even most modern-day cruise ships and was constructed with just seven people over four years. Comfortably able to fit over 5,000 people simultaneously, the structure is not even legally a ship. It's classified as a building due to its massive size. The entire construction, complete with life-size replicas of animals, costs nearly $1.6 million. Although, the only live animals currently on the boat is a small aviary. It's equipped to house all the animals that Noah transported to safety during the biblical flood and is complete with stairs, ladders, and internal gutters for refuge disposal, as well as an amphitheater surrounded by several layers of catwalks and decks. Johan opened his creation to the public upon completion of the project in 2012, but he since had to close it due to conflict with the local government over public safety concerns. This doesn't bother him too much. He claims to have taken on the incredible project as a display of his faith and not a tourist attraction, ultimately hoping he can find a way to get the Ark to Israel as a final resting place. Although the craft is seaworthy and able to it doesn't have motors or propulsion systems, and would require a fleet of hired tugboats to transport it from the Netherlands to Israel, this endeavor alone would cost $1.3 million, almost as much as the construction of the boat itself and it would rely almost entirely upon donations that he is seeking from Good Samaritans. When asked why he would spend years and millions of dollars on creating such a project and then ship it away from his home, he stated that this is a copy of God's ship, it only makes sense to take it to God's land. Were there man-made or left hidden in the ground to be discovered thousands of years later? No matter where you look you can always find something amazing and beautiful on this earth. From building an ark for protection, or as an act of faith, to finding extensive mammoth remains in a field in Michigan, will never stop being surprised and amazed at the feats of nature and man alike. So what do you make of these interesting stories and discoveries? Trial cameras are great for capturing local wildlife. However, sometimes they can capture things that people struggle to explain. Trial cameras work with the camera detecting motion. Once it does, it quickly snaps a photograph and then saves it, which means you can review it at another time. The owner of the camera will normally receive a notification once this happens. However, some owners have been left asking questions once they review the images. And one story was shared by a rancher who couldn't explain what their trial camera had captured. This trial camera was shared to various Bigfoot groups, and there were mixed reactions. Some said that what the rancher had captured didn't match any of the local wildlife, saying that it doesn't match a bear. Those within the group said that Bigfoot is one of the toughest cryptids to capture, so when examining these types of photographs, people should remain skeptical. While others said that is a good example of Bigfoot, and that it doesn't match the typical wildlife that you'd expect to see on a trial camera, 
One person said the following, this photograph matches the typical description of a Bigfoot. It has a large brow ridge that many eyewitnesses have described seeing, and it also has ape-like eyes. Contrary to what most people believe, Bigfoot doesn't have much hair on his face. Most people who have detailed their encounter have said the facial features are quite easy to make out in these creatures. I think this trail cam photo shows a genuine photograph of a Bigfoot. End quote. Others though argued that it looked more human. With one person saying that it could have been someone who just so happened to look into the trail camera. But most who have seen the image have said it doesn't look like a human's face. One of the problems with these types of photographs is that they get shared to online groups, but no one can provide any further details about the photographs. This has led some to suggest that the majority of these are hoaxes. However, not everyone believes this and states that the majority of people who capture these crypts wish to remain anonymous. Bigfoot holds the title as being one of the most famous cryptids. Cryptids are creatures that are not recognized by science, with amateur researchers saying that although scientists don't believe they exist, so many people have reported them that further studies need to be conducted. Bigfoot over time has been used to refer to an ancient legendary creature, a giant human ape-looking figure that's said to run the dense forest of the Pacific Northwest. Over the years, thousands of people have come forward with their encounters, each one matching the previous witnesses. This in turn has caused some to think that there could be a giant undiscovered ape roaming our planet, and that it uses the thick forested regions to stay hidden. Scientists have claimed that the creature bearing resemblance to an ape is a human relative, which dates as far back as 15,000 years ago. Although all of this evidence and claims are yet to be proven, it's as if Bigfoot only selects a certain type of person to reveal itself to, because every scientific endeavor to prove their existence has ended up being a futile journey. There's also been a worrying amount of individuals that have gone missing in forested regions and national parks. Not only this, but individuals have claimed to have seen large humanoids in strange sounds while at these places, causing some to put forward the idea that they prefer to live in isolated places away from humans. Those that have seen Bigfoot have reported seeing footprints and even faces which look like that of a human. But upon closer look at its features, it's evident that it's not a human. Another interesting photograph that was caught on a trial camera was shared back in May of 2020. The owner said they had set up a motion camera as they get a lot of wildlife near their home. He soon received a notification that his camera had captured something, but when he opened up the image he couldn't explain what he was looking at. He said that his camera takes three shots in bursts of three seconds. Interestingly, in the last image, a strange orb-like object can be seen close to a tree stump. The owner couldn't understand what this object was, and so sent the image in to MUFON, which stands for the Mutual UFO Network. They're responsible for keeping a record of thousands of UFO sightings that get reported across the planet. And as of right now, they haven't given us an answer for what the man captured. But that hasn't stopped amateur researchers from putting forward their theories. One individual said the following, I find this photograph interesting as I've seen similar objects close to my property. I live out in Northern California and we have a lot of forests. I describe these objects as looking like balls of light. Every month or so I will see one out in the distance. They usually always give off a bright white color. In some cases, I've had them come close to my house and pulsate, almost as if they're inspecting around the property. This is still happening to this day, and I'm no closer to understanding what these objects are. Others who saw the image said it looked very similar to a UFO orb with those that have researched this topic saying that these orbs are some of the most common UFOs that are witnessed. These glowing orbs come in a variety of different colors, ranging from blue, red, orange, yellow, pink, silver, green, and black. And most people who've seen them have said they appear to pulsate. Eyewitnesses have said they make no noise and are able to travel at extremely fast speeds. Some UFO researchers have said they've reminded them of drones. Interestingly, some have even said they can see a beam of light coming from the object. This is why it's being linked to a UFO, as various eyewitnesses have said that UFOs have this ability. Others have said though that it could be everyday wildlife, but some have said that doesn't explain the beam of light that can be seen. So what do you make of this interesting image? Do you think it shows a big foot? If not, what do you think it is? With so much of our planet being made up of jungle and forest land, 
it is unsurprising that there are secrets and mysteries concealed within these beautiful areas. From finding new animals who live alongside us to uncovering artifacts, the possibilities are boundless as to what we could stumble across within the trees. One can only hope and wonder as to what and who we may find in the future. But for now, we can only reflect on the phenomenal secrets that have been uncovered from within the jungles. So today, we'll be taking a look at three mysteries and discoveries from within our jungles. Igagui Cryptid This bizarre creature has allegedly been found in both Tanzania and Mozambique. A small human-like creature that wanders through the jungles with no definitive proof it is even really there. In appearance, the Igagui has been described as reaching an estimated four feet in height and bearing a brown or ginger-colored hair that covers the entire body. Another distinctive feature of this elusive creature is one long big toe. Whilst this mysterious creature sounds more animalistic than anything else so far, the Igagui walks on two hind legs, just like humans, and has even been known to negotiate with tribes living within the areas. One notable sighting of the Igagui was published in 1937 by Captain William Hitchens, who witnessed the hairy men walk in the 1920s. The captain had been sent on a lion hunt. He was waiting in a forest clearing when two Igagwis moved from one dense area of jungle through a clearing before disappearing on the other side. Captain William Hitchens described russet hair and the expected four feet height. Feeling both fear and amazement upon seeing these creatures, the captain aimed to follow and find the Igagwi but to no avail. Hitchens explains the rationalizing he underwent. Pinning them down as no ordinary monkeys, being ape-like, yet distinctly different than any known ape. Another sighting occurred in 1927 by Cuthbert Burgoyne, who also claimed to have encountered this animal we know very little about. He and his wife were sailing by Portuguese East Africa. As they approached the shore, the couple could see baboons searching for food. Burgoyne explicitly explained that the creatures more closely resembled furry men than the baboons nearby to them. When recounting the story to a friend, he said that they had a similar experience. When the big game hunter friend of Burgoyne's read it himself, loud protests from the natives forbade him shooting this creature. Whilst theories surrounding the Agagui have been limited, it has been established that these animals are distinct from both monkeys and M kind. Despite this certainty, very little more can be said. At the moment, the Igoge is considered to be similar to the Kakandari. Both of these cryptids have been suggested to be a surviving grassal Australopithecine, an early hominid, with a literal translation to a southern ape. These early humans were present in Africa, from the latter end of the Pliocene era, and towards the beginning of the first half of the 20th century. Of the early Pleistocene era, whilst we can draw links and hazard guesses with so few examples and sightings, it is difficult to make further estimates as to exactly what the Agagui are. Reports of Huge Snakes In 1959 Belgian Air Force Colonel Remy Van Leerd spotted something rather peculiar as he flew over the forests of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Van Leerd served at the Kamina Air Base located in Congo which was at the time occupied by Belgium. The colonel had been going home by helicopter after a mission flying over the Katanga region, when he spotted what he described as a huge snake lurking within the forests. The description he gave of the snake was terrifying to say the least, with Van Leerd describing it as reaching 50 feet long, with a head approximately 2 feet in width and 3 feet in length. He also mentioned the head being a triangular shape. If these figures are correct, these hidden snakes earn a rank amongst the longest snakes to live in all the history we have accessible. Regarding color, this mysterious large snake reportedly has green and brown scales on top but has a white underside. This encounter was short-lived, however, as Van Leerd and his pilot were mid-flight. The team, upon Leerd's request, made a U-turn circling round to take another look at this alleged giant snake. Upon the team returning, the snake, assumed to be defending territory, reared his upper this stance was assumed to indicate he was ready to strike as a result of the team's nosy impositions. Regardless, this lifted pose clued Van Leerd in as to the snake having a white colored underneath. Due to the low nature of the helicopter and the aggressive position of the snake, Van Leerd commanded for the flight to continue, not hanging around long enough for trouble to come, leaving this peculiar snake behind without making any specific documentation of it. Some suggest that the photographer aboard managed to capture a relatively blurred image of this curious creature, 
though it has been difficult to definitively trace back to those traveling with Leard. Mostly, people assume that this snake is a vastly oversized African rock python, a product of evolution from descent of the giant Eocene snake Gigantophis. Or perhaps this is a new species of snake altogether. We cannot know for certain. Lost Mountain Temple Discovered in Thai Jungle Within the Nakhon Sai Tamarath province, an ancient structure estimated as being thousands of years old has been uncovered. Historian Fum Ira Chuang announced this exciting revelation online explaining that he and his team, who he had dubbed explorers of the City of Mountains, discovered a series of stone structures, relics, and a rock. Fum explained that he and his explorers first heard whispers and rumors of the settlement existing in 2017 though it took until late 2019 to team up with locals who are accurately considered to be experts of the field. The groups weaved through the jungle until they reached a mountain platform, surrounded by stone walls and piles of rocks. It was also concluded that this site, which was only recently discovered, shared construction and architectural similarities with ruins nearby that had used modern dating techniques to estimate that they had been built in the 6th century BC. Historians believe that it was throughout the late 1st and early 2nd millennium BC that migration began to occur, when the early people who had established homes within the mainland of Southeast Asia then expanded their living areas as society progressed into the Iron Age. This area was certainly not landlocked, having oceans on either side. This was hugely beneficial regarding the maritime trade, largely between the East and West, which again encouraged more people to move. This area of land since 500 BC is believed to have been a key production spot for creating jewelry, fashioned from tin and materials accessible from the forest. This alongside the distribution of bronze drums has led archaeologists to believe that the Ismatian tract was an established part of the communities living by the Gulf of Siam. A report published outlines the production here and the believed association of these neighborhoods with the Lost Temple. Another curious point in this discovery was the series of stone structures. Nakhon Si Thamarat is one of the most respected cities in Thailand. Great historical value, making this ancient city a key historical source. It is believed that this stone structure is a point of worship linking to the king of Srivijaya, who had a strong influence on the Malay Peninsula. This connection of worship and the king is extended as he established a sanctuary dedicated to Buddha and the Bodhisattva was Padmapani and Vajrapani, making his role and authority even greater. So far, according to Fum, an estimated 5% of this newly revealed site has been seen and explored, leaving plenty more discoveries to be found in the future. Despite so little of it having been seen, there is a believed connection between this new temple and the Khao Ka ancient remains. These remains are in Nakhon Si the Marat and is one of the biggest and grandest Hindu temples within the south of Thailand. The driving point behind this inspired connection is the cultural link between the Khao Ka temple and this lost temple is the archaeologist's discovery of stone bowls at the site as well as Shiva Lingam. These items correlate with the nature of worship suggesting this was carried out here too, as both sites feature this stone structure. After Pham and his team made the discovery, park rangers and local authorities were alerted. Progress has been halted as the site cannot be dated until the remainder of the rainforest area has been thoroughly searched. This Khao Ka archaeological site is a fantastic visit, a place of worship that is open to visitors. Attempts to uncover the secrets and mysteries of the jungles will certainly outlast our lifetimes, potentially being a mission that we never accomplish. The exciting animals and speculated creatures have a home that keeps them out of the spotlight. Though with advancing research methodology, we become more and more likely to stumble across something new each day. What could be the next discovery pulled from a junkyard? What do you make of these jungle mysteries and discoveries? The incredible civilization of ancient Egypt is one that's not only impressive, but also shrouded in mystery. Every year people take photographs of the impressive structures, but once in a while a photograph will be shared that shows something mysterious in the background. This is what happened when someone took this photograph of the iconic structures. The image in question seems to show two pyramid-like objects, along with two white arms. This excited many UFO researchers as for years they've been saying that the Egyptians were visited by extraterrestrials. As I've mentioned before, one of the earliest UFO encounters was said to have been detailed in an old Egyptian papyrus, with the witnesses saying that the objects were brighter than the sun, 
even going on to detail them as a circle of fire or a fiery disc. This is just one of the reasons why people think that the ancient Egyptians may have had outside help. Once shared to UFO groups, believers started to theorize about what these objects were. Some said that the pyramid-shaped UFO is not often seen, with the triangle and disc being some of the most common ones, but further saying that the large pyramid crafts have been reported by people all across the world, and have said that the majority of reports follow a similar theme, saying that these crafts are usually large and don't make a sound. Others noted that the orb-shaped objects in the background are usually seen close to larger crafts, saying that some UFO researchers believe that these orbs are like drones for the bigger crafts. Skeptics said though that there's a chance the images are fake, and that just because strange shapes are seen above the pyramids we shouldn't just jump to UFOs. This isn't the only mystery of ancient Egypt. Ancient Egypt is perhaps one of the most interesting civilizations that's graced our planet. Still, to this day, various questions have been unanswered. And every year, new discoveries are still being made that give us an insight into their way of life. Though many historians and Egyptologists originally believed that the ancient Egyptian civilization only had a basic system of linear mathematics, this theory proved to be completely untrue. It appears that not only were the mathematical developments far more superior than previously understood, but that work to uncover more of their discoveries is still ongoing as it appears their mathematics might be more advanced than our own understanding today. Today, the capital city Cairo holds the location of antique buildings like the Egyptian Museum, which contains some of the world's most impressive historical artifacts. The Great Pyramid of Giza is a true ancient engineering wonder. This pyramid is not only among the ancient world's seven wonders, but it's the oldest and most historical amongst them. In fact, it's the only one among those wonders that have stood the test of time and is still standing to date. Researchers have been fascinated with this ancient structure, and mainly because there's still many unanswered questions that Egyptologists and researchers can't seem to agree on. One of the most interesting conversations is that of the missing capstone. The last thing to be placed on the pyramid would have been that of the capstone. Interestingly, over the years some researchers have suggested there wasn't a capstone at all, and instead the pyramid would have had an empty space at the top. However, other researchers have dismissed these claims and said that no ruler would have left a job unfinished and would have demanded that an impressive capstone sat at the top of the pyramid. Devoid of its original coating of white limestone blocks, the Great Pyramid also lacks its summit, which gave it approximately another 9 meters in height. Many people believe that the capstone of the Great Pyramid of Giza was made of gold, and it was somehow removed from the top of the pyramid in the distant past. But some have struggled to imagine someone removing a capstone made entirely out of gold from the top of the pyramid. Interestingly, one theory proposed by Spanish researcher Miguel Perez Sanchez indicates that the Great Pyramid wasn't left unfinished and that a massive sphere was located on its surface. Perez Sanchez proposes that the sphere the ancient Egyptians placed at the top of the pyramid symbolizes the Eye of Horus and had a diameter of 2,718 royal cubits of 2.7 meters. The sphere located on the pyramid was placed as a worship to the sun and Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. In addition of the sphere located on the top of the pyramid, analysis enabled researchers to find out the inclination angle 5,184 degrees, the platform that supported the sphere with a pi perimeter of royal cubits and the height of the pyramidal vertex of 277,778 cubits. According to Pura Sanchez, the discovery of the original shape and dimensions of the Great Pyramid, its reconstruction and analysis revealed an architecture made of pure mathematics, geometry, and astronomy. Many have said that such an impressive structure must hold all kinds of secrets. There's no doubt that a lot of hard work and resilience went into building this giant structure which some researchers have said was initially built as a tomb. Studies have shown that it must have taken roughly a decade or two to build this structure. Standing at 481 feet at the time, the pyramid would have held the title of the tallest structure any man has ever built. Although researchers and explorers cannot boldly say that they've uncovered all of the secrets of the Great Pyramid just yet, they have uncovered quite a lot of its secrets in the past couple of years. The Great Pyramid of Giza is estimated to have a volume of around 2,583,283 cubic meters. This data goes to show that this pyramid is a truly monumental structure. In order to build such a massive structure, 
millions of stones each weighing an average of three tons were moved to the site. Tons of granite and millions of limestone were also made use of to build this incredible piece of art. As huge as the Great Pyramid of Giza is, there are many who believe that the builders weren't actually able to complete its construction and that they may have had help. So what do you make of this interesting photograph taken above the pyramids? Do you think it shows unidentified flying objects? If not, what do you think the individual captured? It's no secret that water is dangerous, but you may be surprised to know about all of the unusual and mysterious events that take place in and around lakes. Not only do many people lose their lives in water, but there has been a handful of perplexing and supernatural occurrences by large bodies of water. So today we'll be taking a look at three mysterious haunted lakes. Lake Shawnee Amusement Park may be haunted. Lake Shawnee Amusement Park was once a place where families, teenagers, and young adults would visit for a day of fun. Unfortunately, it's now abandoned and there has been a series of dark events that have taken place ever since. The park is located in West Virginia in the United States and has become known as one of the most haunted amusement parks in the world. Long before there was an amusement park, the land was used as a burial ground for the Shawnee tribe. Experts estimate that the land holds over 3,000 bodies, but those aren't the only people who have passed away at Lake Shawnee. In 1775, a family of white settlers built a home right atop the burial ground, which, for obvious reasons, upset the Shawnee people who saw the land as sacred. Devastated that the family was not respecting their land, they warned them and decided to attack in 1783. A group of tribesmen entered the home and attacked the youngest son who was working in the fields, then brutally attacked the daughter with a knife and finally kidnapped the eldest son and eventually set him alight. Upon coming home to find the family attacked and no longer alive, the white settlers gathered a group of settlers to get vengeance on the Shawnee people. The area was not touched for a while after the attack, until a man by the name of Snido purchased the land in the 1920s to build an amusement park. Whether he was aware of the land's history or not, he didn't seem bothered. By the 1920s, the park was up and running and people came, despite the tragic history of the land. However, slowly but surely the history of the land made its way back to Lake Shawnee and children started passing away. The first was a young girl who was on a fast-moving swing that was hit by a truck driving by. Another fatal incident occurred in 1966 when a boy's arm got caught in the drainage pipe of the pond. He was considered missing for quite some time until they found his body over a week later in the water. Between the opening of the park and 1966, approximately six lives were lost. After the boy's passing in 1966, the park was closed and abandoned as the attractions and rides were left behind to rot. People continue to visit the park and speak of experiencing chilling sounds and spooky figures in the background of their photos. The swings are by far the most haunted part in the park. People report seeing a swing move on its own, as well as sighting a young girl in a pink dress that is stained with blood. Sit on the swing or stand nearby. The owner of the park spoke of the story of the young girl who passed away there and had mentioned that she was wearing a pink dress. He also claims to have seen her ghost many times for himself. The Ferris wheel is also considered a spooky site at the park where ghostly figures have appeared and vanished before one's eyes. The pond is even more mysterious and haunted, as people have seen the water move and shadowed figures emerge from below the surface. Many paranormal television shows have taken a liking to the story behind Lake Shawnee and the amusement park and have sent paranormal experts to uncover answers. Unfortunately, no one has been able to prove that ghosts haunt the park, but it's known by all that step foot on the land. Would you visit the park? Braley Pond, Virginia. Next up is Braley Pond, which has been a popular campground in Virginia, USA. It's more specifically located in George Washington National Forest and has been known for its mysterious activity. Many have claimed that other campsites within the park are haunted as well, but Braley Pond is associated with chilling stories. Visitors describe the pond as tranquil and serene. First, that is. The hauntings began after a horrific attack took place in 2003 when a local gang member attacked a 19-year-old boy before dumping his body in the water. A visitor also took their own life in the same spot in the park. Ever since people have felt eerie energy and spirits at Brady Pond, but it doesn't stop there. Closer to the pond itself, 
where people have witnessed ghosts hovering above the water and heard children's voices in the distance. Many ghost hunters have made their way to the most haunted campsite in Virginia and have left fearing for their lives. One of the most unusual aspects and feelings visitors get when visiting this campsite and pond is a sudden burst of nausea and disorientation. This has happened many times to hikers with no previous information surrounding the hauntings at Braley Pond. The pond specifically is truly haunting. People have reported a feeling of being watched, seen the water splash about whilst no one is in it and some have experienced a strange calling to jump into the water. One paranormal researcher who visited in 2006 took their own life shortly after, leaving us to wonder if it had something to do with Braley Pond. Another paranormal researcher by the name of Shay Willis experienced extremely unusual activity while spending time at the campsite one evening. She had that nauseous feeling and saw activity in the water, but also witnessed a green orb in the sky. She was there with another researcher who had a sudden feeling that something was watching them and was pulled into the water. As they made their way back to the truck, Willis felt tentacles on her and screamed for her partner to get them off, but there was nothing there. She continued to feel the tentacles and have vivid dreams about the experience for weeks afterwards. This leads us to question what is in the water. Are there spirits haunting the Braley Pond and campsite? Are they out to get people who are simply passing by? We may never know, but one thing is for sure, you certainly wouldn't want to be left there alone overnight. Sacco River, Maine our last mysterious and haunted lake can be found in Maine, USA. The lake has apparently been cursed since the 1600s, dating back to a story about a native named Squando who was the chief of the Sacco tribe. He was taking a stroll down by the river one day with his newborn baby and wife in 1675 when they came across three drunken sailors from England. They took the baby and threw her into the river. The mother did her best to save her baby girl. She was able to reach the infant and bring her back to shore, but she passed away shortly after. Afterwards, the chief was so upset to have lost his daughter that he cast a curse upon the river, proclaiming that it would take three men each year. Locals are hesitant to go near the river due to knowing the history of this river and the curse it holds. While many people over the years have lost their lives in the river, could this simply be a coincidence or maybe the curse continues to take the lives of many? Some people claim to have seen the river monster which is sometimes referred to as the white monkey, referring to the human-like appearance. The most recent sighting was in 1970, so it's been a while since anyone has shed light on this tale. Since nothing noteworthy has happened in recent years at the Seiko River, does that mean it's no longer haunted? No one can be too sure. It may just be an old wives' tale for all we know. After exploring these three mysterious lakes, it's not easy to ignore the many stories and tragic loss of lives that have taken place at each spot. Would you go swimming or camping in these locations? What do you make of these disturbing haunted lakes? For centuries, People relayed magnificent stories, some of which were taken as fact before researchers would disprove them. Hundreds of years ago, the world was a different place. If someone did something out of the ordinary, it wasn't uncommon for them to be labeled as magic. In fact, this even happened during Nikola Tesla's lifetime to show how ahead he was when he was demonstrating a remote-controlled boat at an exhibition at Madison Square Garden. Everyone couldn't believe what they were seeing, and even branded Tesla as some sort of magician demanding that the boat be torn open and prove that he hadn't shrunk people inside it. It must have been frustrating for Tesla to be trying to put forward his ideas in a time like this, where instead of being appreciated, people just wrote off your workers' fantasy and magic. Other interesting stories that have been passed down is that of supposed time travelers. For years, various people have claimed to have been time travelers, and that they've been given a mission to carry out in order to help the past. Although scientists and researchers have said this is impossible, and that anyone claiming to be a time traveler is a fraud, others believe these claims, and say that government documents prove that officials have been investigating time travel, and that they've been able to harness it. One interesting individual that came forward and claimed there was a time traveler was a woman named Clara. In early 2018, Clara claimed that she was working with the government and military on a special mission. This mission started in 2000, and involved her going back in time to the year 3780, where she had to bring back an important piece of technology that would be used by humans of the past. When she questioned what this tech would be used for, 
she claimed she was told not to ask questions. When questioned about her journey and time travel, she said the following, imagine time as a measurement such as height, length, or depth. Let's say you're swimming in the sea at a depth of two meters. You can easily go deeper. This is the same thing that you can do with time if you have the appropriate equipment and knowledge. End quote. She claims that the military has the ability to travel back in time and that they've been doing this for a while, saying that certain individuals are selected to go on these missions and that each one is very important. Interestingly, this isn't the first individual to come forward and claim that they've worked with the government on time travel. Another woman who wished to be kept anonymous stated that she's been sent on a mission to the future to see where we went wrong and said that the future does not look bright for humanity. She said there will be more division than ever and that humans sold themselves to technology. She goes on to say that this is currently happening right now, but within the next 100 years things just get worse. She states that there's a huge division in the world and that people are struggling. There are more homeless people and poverty than ever. People don't leave their houses much and that the majority of people are owned by the government. Although some have said these are just stories and that there's no way to back them up. Recently, some interesting documents have been made public and some of them have caught people's attention. The United States government is well known for conducting a variety of strange research experiments. Oddly enough, however, this seems to be a recently declassified government experiment that was approved for release back in 2003 surrounding the training of psychic soldiers and enhancements to the brain known as the Gateway Process Experience Experiments. The declassified document titled Analysis and Assessment of Gateway Process seems to be a written memo between a U.S. Army researcher at the CIA and sent to a U.S. Army operational commander located out of Fort Meade. The subject of the memo seems to have been the analysis surrounding the legitimacy of the Gateway Process study, as the researcher writes the following in an opening statement. You asked me to provide an assessment of the gateway experience in terms of its mechanics and ultimate practicality. Most likely the U.S. government was unaware of what the gateway process really entailed, and so sent an independent researcher to the experimentation areas to undergo the process and learn if there was any legitimacy to this study in the first place for continued funding. Within the first paragraph of the document, however, the researcher makes a special note to include that the gateway process was a technique designed by Isaac Bentov, Stating the following, I had recourse to the biomedical models developed by Isaac Bentov to obtain information concerning the physical aspects of the process. For those that are not aware, Isaac Bentov was a leading Israeli researcher, known for his incredible contributions in the creations of patents for the steerable heart catheter, ECG electrodes, pacemaker leads, and a number of other patents that would help to form the Boston Scientific Medical Tech Corporation. However, what many are not aware of surrounding the Israeli inventor was his devout belief in following into the mystical side of consciousness, which would lead to his primary contributions to the gateway process experiment. The document then goes into the breakdown of what the gateway process holds, with the first explanation from the researcher being in regards to the human body's natural frequency of the brain and the frequency following response. A form of enlightenment can be triggered in a person's mind when both hemispheres of the brain begin operating at the same frequency allowing them to communicate without any form of distraction and leading to a heightened state of focus. In the document, the researcher details the following statement. To achieve synchronization of brain hemispheres, the hemisync technique takes advantage of a phenomenon known as the frequency following response, or the FFR, which means that if a subject hears a sound produced at a frequency which emulates one of those associated with the operation of the human brain, the brain will try to mimic the same frequency pattern by adjusting its brainwave output. Therefore, if the subject is in a fully awake state but hears sound frequencies, which approximates brainwave output at a theater level, the subject's brain will endeavor to alter brainwave pattern from the normal beta to the theta level. The document then ends with the researchers stating that the gateway process experience should be provided to all members of the organization for heightened mental ability. Although the document fails to elaborate on the finding, the memo then states that the training could open up members of the gateway process to be attacked by intelligent energy beings if the boundaries of time and space are continually surpassed. Subjects must be intellectually prepared to react to possible encounters with intelligent non-corporeal energy forms when time-space boundaries are exceeded. End quote. With additional statements that perhaps practical use of the gateway process experience should be used to gather information from such entities and the universal consciousness. So what do you make of time travel and of the strange experiment known as the gateway experience?
For years people have been telling stories, and some of the most interesting ones are those that talk about the paranormal. While on Reddit, I got talking to someone who told me an incredible story. They revealed that they were a former U.S. Marine, and while stationed in California something happened that changed their life. He said the following, and I'm interested to see what people make of it. Since it happened, I've tried to make sense of it, but at the time I didn't open up about it because I know I would have been ridiculed. I won't go into too much detail, but at the time of the encounter, I was stationed in California. The encounter happened during a military exercise. We were dropped into the nearby forest. Around 20 minutes into the exercise, I'd split up from my group, but I could see them off into the distance. As I started to catch up to them, a loud knock caught my attention. The noise came from my left. The first thing I thought was that someone threw something at me. It turned out though that the loud thud wasn't created by an object hitting the ground, but rather by something. As I looked through the trees, I could see the outline of what looked like a large human. At this point I would say I was around 80 meters from whatever this thing was, so I couldn't work out what exactly I was looking at. Again though, I heard the loud thud, but this time I could see that this thing in the distance was creating it. It had hold of a thick branch that I would guess was around four feet in length and a few feet in circumference. After slowly moving towards the direction of the noise, I could see what appeared to be a humanoid-like creature. This thing stood approximately seven feet tall, and each time I inch closer it would hit the nearby tree with a branch in its hand, sending echoes throughout the forest. This time though I bolted it in the direction of my team, and I didn't look back. As I said, I've never told anyone this story, but I'm certain of what I saw. It's tough because I keep going over that day, and I know how far-fetched it sounds. But I know exactly what I saw. What I found interesting though is that after scrolling through Reddit and reading up on those that spent time in the military, a lot of them have experienced strange stuff that they can't explain. Although the majority of their stuff centers around the paranormal, it made me feel a little better that I wasn't the only one that had a strange experience. End quote. Many stories have come to the surface over the years involving Bigfoot, with eyewitnesses saying that enough people have encountered this cryptid that sightings should be taken more seriously. There have been many reported sightings of a massive legendary creature known as Bigfoot all over the world. They are mostly sighted in remote areas, sometimes in urban areas and very rarely in city parks. However, the most unlikely place you would think to see a Bigfoot is near a military base. Yet some researchers have argued that there's been more reports of Bigfoot being sighted by military personnel than civilians. Throughout the years there have been a few reports that have been leaked from military installations, mostly those around the 1970s. By far the most notable and most credible is that of an encounter near Fort Lewis in the U.S. This is an army military installation in Washington state, which is in the middle of a rather large wooded area. The year was 1978. A truck full of soldiers coming back from training exercises broke down at around 8 p.m. Attempts were made to restart the engine, but nothing worked. So the platoon headed off to the base on foot to bring back a tow truck. They left one Edwin Godoy to guard the truck until the tow truck arrived. He was left because he was the one who signed the truck out. Edwin spent hours by himself just sitting in the trunk. He was bored, but this evening would soon perk up. At around midnight, he began to hear strange sounds from the forest that the road cut through. The sounds continued to get louder and closer, prompting Edwin to get out of the truck, arming himself with a rifle and a flashlight. As he stood in front of the truck, sweeping the sides of the woods with his flashlight, he caught a glimpse of a large object moving directly in front of his trunk. It was a tall, broad creature entirely covered in hair that walked by swinging its body sideways. When Edwin shunned his light at it, it stopped in its tracks and stared directly at him. They locked eyes for a short time before the creature began to run at him at a baffling quick speed. He shouted three times for the creature to stop and identify itself. However, the beast didn't reply and got close enough to cause harm to Edwin. Gripped with fear, he shot the creature in the chest, this barely stopping the speed of the animal. It merely growled grabbed its chest and turned to the right and went back into the forest. In a few seconds, it was gone. After a long and fearful night, the mechanics finally arrived. After Edwin conveyed what happened, 
They were quite skeptical until one spotted the blood trail that led to the massive footprints pressed into the nearby soft ground. Shortly after, a radio call was made to the base explaining what had happened. The aerial was swamped by secretive government scientists and hazardous material suits. These researchers then began taking blood samples and setting cast of the footprints. The whole time, Edwin was told not to speak to anyone and was kept away from what was going on. After a short time, Edwin was quickly taken away to the base hospital, but surprisingly, instead of being examined by the base's medical staff, he was examined by a doctor from the Air Force that held the rank of full colonel. Years later, Edwin went on to reveal in an interview after the event had been declassified that rather than interrogating him, the colonel was very interested in every slight detail of the event, after which Edwin was returned to his barracks and told in no circumstances was he to tell anyone what happened. So what do you make of these interesting stories? Despite their sad connotations, cemeteries are often peaceful, pretty places. They offer people a chance to mourn and remember loved ones and are often set amongst beautiful greenery. Cemeteries are places that can have polar opposite atmospheres, depending on the context that they're placed in. As long as horror and a belief in the supernatural has existed, cemeteries have been the settings of choice for all sorts of ghastly and ghoulish predicaments. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at three haunted cemeteries. Greenwood Cemetery, Washington State. Washington State is one of America's most stunning states. Both the Blue and Rocky Mountain Ranges weave their way through Washington and are surrounded by beautiful valleys out towards the Pacific Coast. Given the state's scenic nature, you'd be forgiven for assuming that this beauty would also be reflected in places which incorporated nature into their design, such as cemeteries, national parks, and zoos. And on the face of it, this is true for Greenwood Cemetery, officially Greenwood Memorial Terrace, located in Spokane, U.S. The cemetery itself is set openly on two sides of a fairly main road. It's littered with tall evergreens, which conceal a large portion of the cemetery once the road twists away from the main site. As idyllic as it may look, however, Greenwood Cemetery hides a sinister story in its park-like grounds. The Greenwood Staircase is noted as one of Spokane's haunted sites. When created in the late 1800s, the cemetery was initially meant to be a large garden modeled upon the European garden cemeteries of the Victorian era. Naturally, this meant that fancy landscaping was a plenty in the garden, which exists to this day. It is thought that the original entrance to the garden, which saw its first burial on July 1, 1888, was a large staircase with a mausoleum at the top. However, over the years, alternative entrances were created and the stairs were slowly left to rot alongside the mausoleum. Despite renovation works, the stairs are hardly used today, and perhaps that's for the best given some of the stories that they have originated. This ancient staircase is thought to be haunted in a few different ways. Legend has it that if you climb the stairs, through the overgrowth and brambles, you'll be accompanied by the voices of the deceased. From the cemetery, as you attempt to reach the top, the deceased will rise from the grave and meet you on the staircase. In a devilish attempt to stop you from reaching the top, they'll overcome you with haunting feelings, poltergeist behavior, and one or two seriously big scares. The staircase has been dubbed as having the effect of climbing 1,000 steps, as those who climb it will allegedly never reach the top, either turned back by the paranoia perhaps due to something more sinister. Thought to have been used for dark, satanic rituals throughout history, those who have for some reason climbed the stairs in the night have allegedly experienced this paranormal activity. But if you do manage to make it to the top of the stairs, you are rewarded with a breathtaking view of Spokane County in all its beauty. The Haunted Resurrection Cemetery, a city cemetery, Resurrection Cemetery, in southwest Chicago, Illinois, is bordered by ordinary suburban housing, some forestry in the north of the cemetery, and beyond that, mostly warehouses. Resurrection isn't the most spectacular cemetery that you'll ever lay your eyes upon, and its flat, non-protruding landscape is a testament to this. However, the events and legends surrounding Resurrection Cemetery are not so plain. The legend for which the cemetery is famous for is that of the Resurrection Mary. A variation of vanishing hitchhiker folklore, the legend of the Resurrection Mary is one that wouldn't look out of place in Hollywood. It developed in the 30s, 
a time of growth and repair yet also poverty and angst in America, and plays on very American horror ideals. Yet for some, the Resurrection Mary is as real as ghost stories get. But who or what actually is the Resurrection Mary? The tale originates from a leisurely ballroom dance that took place one evening in 1934 at O. Henry Ballroom on Arger Avenue, the same road that Resurrection Cemetery is situated on. Twenty-year-old Mary Bregavy had been dancing with her boyfriend deep into the evening, as was common in the thirties. However, as can sometimes happen, the evening turned sour. At some point during the ordeal, Mary and her boyfriend got into a row and she stormed out of upset, confused, and most definitely not in a state of complete mental clarity at that point. Mary fatefully stepped out into the road where she was hit by a car which resulted in her passing away. Mary was buried in the adjacent Resurrection Cemetery in her favorite white gown, and that was thought to be the sorry end to a tragic event. In 1939, a man named Jerry Pallas stopped to pick up a young female hitchhiker by the gates of Resurrection Cemetery. He noted that she was strangely quiet, but very attractive and wearing a pretty white dress. Jerry then asked the girl to dance with him at the ballroom on the same road. Once the evening was over, Jerry offered to drive the girl home. She lived on the other side of town, but they had only driven a few hundred feet down the road when she asked him to stop the car. She got out at the cemetery, thanked Jerry for the ride, and then simply vanished. Jerry drove onto the address that the girl had originally given him to drop her off at. There, he spoke with the girl's mother and explained the events of that evening. But more than anything, the mother seemed confused. And then she said to Jerry, my daughter passed away five years ago. Some years later, Jerry spoke out about the bizarre events of that evening, saying, it was then that I understood why the woman I was dancing with that night was ice cold to the touch. I had worked in a funeral home for a while and it was the touch of a corpse. It was some years later until the next story of the ghostly girl in white made the news. Throughout the 80s, police officers, tourists and locals all spoke of strange experiences they had on Archer Avenue by the cemetery gates late at night. As a matter of fact, many of the stories of Resurrection Mary came from level-headed, rational men with no previous history, of mental illness, that only makes it all the more creepier. Howard Street Cemetery Haunting The Howard Street Cemetery is located in Salem, Massachusetts. Howard Street forms a T-junction with Brown Street where the Salem Witch Museum is situated. So in terms of setting the cemetery already is a spooky one. Set amongst period Gothic Salem architecture, the cemetery lies ominously on an open flat piece of land that is extremely atmospheric under the typical rainy gray skies. That often grace Massachusetts. Sparse trees line the outside of the cemetery and the land itself is raised a little from the road, putting Howard Cemetery on a sort of ghostly plinth. Arranged in broken rows, Many of the graves in Howard Cemetery date back to the early 18th century. Amongst them are Revolutionary War heroes and sailors, but unfortunately no witches lie in the ground of the cemetery. Or at least, this has never been verified. The site is thought to have been the location of the execution of Giles Corey, a Salem farmer who famously refused to plead neither guilty nor not guilty when charged with being a witch in 1692. Corey was left for days under the crushing weight of the rocks piled on his back and passed away. His remains lie buried in the soil of what is now the Howard Street Cemetery. Throughout the 15 and 1600s, which crazes and which hunts were occurring all over the world. But although we know today that those accused of witchcraft were most definitely not witches, Giles Corey's story goes slightly against the norm. He allegedly placed a curse on the Sheriff of Salem and all who came after him, and a few years later, the sheriff suddenly passed away of a heart attack. Although that could just be a coincidence. However, strangely enough, over the years, a number of Salem sheriffs have been forced into retirement and or suffered several health issues, often to do with the heart. It is widely noted that doctors haven't been able to work out why these sheriffs have suffered these specific problems, almost as if they are the work of the supernatural. The cemetery is known to be particularly haunting at night, with several dim oil lamps casting pale rays of light over the dark gravestones. After all, who really knows what the nighttime hides in Howard Cemetery? What do you make of these haunted cemeteries? Who knows the extent of the secrets that these graveyards really hold? The RMS Titanic is one of the most famous ships still to this day, 
costing $7.5 million in 1912, which equates to $400 million in today's dollars to construct. On the deadly night of April 14, 1912, over 1,500 people lost their lives to the freezing cold waters of the Atlantic Ocean. So today we'll be taking a look at Titanic facts and discoveries. Is this the iceberg that sank the Titanic? A rare photo that allegedly captured the beast of a berg that sank the RMS Titanic was recently appraised for a massive $10,000 to $15,000 at a recent auction. It is thought that the photo was snapped by Captain W. Wood of the SS Atenean, not far from where the ship collided with the infamous iceberg. However, whether or not this particular iceberg is the one that actually sank the Titanic remains under scrutiny. The photo, purportedly taken just 40 hours before the tragic impact on the night of the April 14, 1912, shows an iceberg with a jagged top. The photo carries an inscription that reads, Iceberg taken by Captain Wood S. S. Etonian, April 12th at 4 p.m. 1913. The inscription states that the photo was taken by the captain of the SS Etonian not far from where the impact occurred and was, for some reason, dated the year after. This has puzzled most since the photo was discovered. Some say that the photo could have indeed been taken one year after the collision, as the inscription states, because the iceberg in this photo appears to be much smaller in height than other possible photographs of the iceberg in question. We're selling the piece. The letter that Captain Wood sent alongside the photo authenticates his own claims. In one section of the letter, Captain Wood writes, I am sending you a sea picture. The Atenean running before a gale and the iceberg that sank the Titanic. We crossed the ice tracks 40 hours before her and in daylight so saw the ice easily. The notes on the inscription seem to match the location that the Titanic's iceberg was originally located at. Which goes a long way in establishing credibility in the photo. However, despite the overwhelming evidence that appears to validate Captain Wood's inscription, there have been other photographs of the supposed iceberg that have received a similar level of scrutiny. An example in 2015 from a black and white photograph of an oddly shaped iceberg resurfaced, and it is alleged that it was taken in 1912 by M. Lennonwald, chief steward of the SS Prince Adele. In the note that he wrote to accompany the photo, he states, on the day after the sinking of the Titanic, the steamer Prince Adalbert passes the iceberg. The Titanic disaster was not yet known by us. On one side, red paint was visible, which has the appearance of having been made by the scraping of a vessel on the iceberg. This photo is dated just one day after the sinking, and Leno Wenwald points to red paint visible on one side, which would have been left by the Titanic after the iceberg scraped along its hull and lower portions. All of this could be a sign that it is a more accurate representation of the infamous iceberg. However, other photographs of the iceberg in question have also emerged, including this photo. This shows the red paint along the edge of the iceberg. This photograph, however, is not attributed to anyone, and the specific location and time at which it was taken are still unknown. On the other hand, according to one of the auctioneers that handled the photograph captured by Captain Wood, his photo closely matches sketches that were made of the iceberg by one of the lookouts in the Titanic's crow's nest at the time. Their sketches both appear similar to the iceberg in this photo and have the same distinctive odd shape at the top. However, he then goes on to counter this claim, stating that despite the overwhelming evidence that confirms that the photo does in fact show the iceberg that sank. The Titanic, it's impossible to know for sure. Therefore, Finding a conclusive way to identify the specific iceberg that impacted the Titanic, taking over 1,500 passengers to their doom, remains to this very day elusive. The sinking of the Titanic, from Capsis to SS Carpathia, one of the most disturbing facts about the sinking of the Titanic is that the crew and the captain himself were all made aware of the icy conditions in the area. These conditions were, at the time, attributed to a mild winter. It was this winter that had caused large numbers of icebergs to drift off away from Greenland's western coast. It is thought that the iceberg which caused the Titanic to sink is one of Greenland's very own. The day before the collision and well into the night, the Titanic's radio generators received six consecutive warning messages about ice in the area. However, not all of these messages were relayed, and it's believed that this is due to the fact that the radio operator's primary responsibility was to send and receive passengers' messages with weather warnings pushed to the side. The first of the six warnings came from the RMS Corona, 
which was sailing some miles away, reporting bergs, growlers, and field ice. Captain Smith acknowledged his receipt of this message, but made no alterations to the ship's speed or direction. The second and third warnings came a few hours later in quick succession. First at 1.42 p.m. from the RMS Baltic, which warned of passing icebergs. This message was acknowledged by Captain Smith and relayed to Mr. Ismay, the chairman of the White Star Line at the time. They deliberated for a while after which the captain ordered for a new course to be set heading further south. The next message received by the Titanic was from a German ship. The SS America just a few minutes later at 1.45 p.m. and warned them of their passing of two large icebergs. This message never managed to reach Captain Smith, so it was left unheard. The fourth and fifth warnings were received within an hour of each other, one at 7.30 p.m. and again at 9.40 p.m. from the SS Californian and the SS Masaba respectively. Both ships ice and three large bergs in the area. Whether or not these messages were received, however, is still unknown. By the time that the last known warning was given, most passengers had retired to their bedrooms and the command of the bridge was handed to First Officer William Murdoch. The air temperature had fallen to near freezing and the ocean was completely calm. This would later be discovered to be a red flag sign of nearby pack ice but was the time. The last and final warning was received at 10.30 p.m., just 50 minutes before the impact itself. This warning came from Cyril Evans, the operator of the SS Californian which had halted for the night due to a heavy ice field some miles away. In response to this all-important final warning message, the captain simply urged the crew to continue at 22 knots as normal. According to 5th Officer Harold Lowe, this was completely justified, as the custom was to depend on the lookouts in the crow's nest and to watch on the bridge to pick up the ice in time. Contrary to this, according to Colonel Archibald Gracie, a survivor, the sea was like glass. With such calm waters and no visible sign of movement to give away approaching icebergs, the lookouts couldn't see any icebergs until it was too late. Collision at 11.30 p.m. There were two lookouts, Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee, standing guard within Titanic's crow's nest, 29 meters above the deck. The ocean appeared to be completely calm and unbroken in the dim light of the stars. Fleet was the first to notice a minimal haze on the horizon ahead, but did not make anything of it initially. Some say that this was a mirage provoked by the icy waters meeting the humid air, which temporarily blinded the lookouts. Just nine minutes later, at 11.39 p.m., Fleet finally spotted the iceberg straight ahead in Titanic's path. He phoned the bridge to tell 6th Officer James Moody, who then relayed the message to Murdoch. Murdoch ordered the quartermaster Robert Hitchens to turn the ship hard starboard, which involved moving the ship's steering lever all the way to the right side, in what is now known as a vain attempt to turn the ship to port. Murdoch then attempted a port-around maneuver, in which the ship's bow would, in theory, swing around the iceberg, followed by the stern, so both ends of the ship would avoid collision. However, there was a 30-second delay before either order was carried out, and the task of putting the engines into reverse took a while to engineer. The center turbine could not be reversed, so the center propeller stopped, thus reducing the effectiveness and as a result the ship's ability to turn. Somewhat luckily, the Titanic changed direction in just enough time to avoid a head-on collision, but it still wasn't quick enough to evade the glancing blow. The bottom of the iceberg, hidden beneath the water surface, struck the ship along the side for several seconds. This jagged scraping left disconnected tears in the hull of the ship, allowing tons of water to pour into the lower bulkheads and storage compartments. Stewards in first class alongside many of the passengers first, second, and third class felt a prolonged shudder. Passengers on the lower decks and in their bunks in steerage and third class felt the impact far more directly. One of the firemen, George Kamesh, reported hearing a heavy third and grinding tearing sound, but none of the passengers had any idea of what had actually happened, because the stewards were told to tell them that it was simply a problem with the propellers to avoid. Panic. The ship flooded immediately, water pouring into the bulkheads at approximately 7 tons per second. The stokers and firemen in the boiler rooms were ordered to vent the boilers to send the boiling steam back up the funnel venting pipes. By this point, however, they were submerged in ice-cold water that was impossible to pump out fast enough. The lower decks of the Titanic were divided into 16 compartments, 
each separated by a bulkhead that ran the each of these bulkheads could be sealed by watertight doors controlled remotely from the bridge. These took 30 seconds to close, with alternative escape groups administered so the crew would not be trapped. However, these bulkheads were not sealed at the top, and it is this design oversight which allowed the water to spill over into the five consecutive compartments starting from the bow of the ship. Unfortunately, the Titanic was only designed to be able to float with two to four compartments flooded. As a result, the four peak tank, three forward holds and one boiler room were left severely damaged, forcing the ship's bow to sink deeper and deeper into the water. Captain Smith felt the collision from his cabin and came to the bridge, where he immediately inspected the damage. He found that the forward cargo holds, mail room, squash court and the number six boiler room were all flooded beyond repair. He summoned Thomas Andrews the long since that the Titanic was, in fact, extremely threatened. First lifeboats lowered. It took Captain Smith until 12.05 a.m. on the 15th of April, just over an hour, to finally make the order to uncover the lifeboats and muster all the passengers. Stewards were commanded to conduct door-to-door -door evacuations, routing the passengers and other crewmen, and direct them towards the boat deck. How thoroughly the passengers were checked and mustered was dependent on their class. First-class stewards were able to spend more time with each first-class passenger, reassuring them at great lengths and informing them of the right outfits to wear for chilly weather. To contrast, the second- and third-class stewards were in charge of large numbers of lower-class passengers and were, therefore, unable to spend much more than a few seconds with each, mostly confined to opening doors and shouting at the passengers to put their life belts on. Even worse, the third-class passengers were mostly left to figure things out on their own and were simply told to go out to the boat deck. None of the passengers were told that the ship was sinking. At around 12.20 a.m., the lowering of the 20 lifeboats on board, including 16 wooden boats on davits and four collapsed boats, was finally underway. On average, each of these boats could carry up to 68 passengers, collectively carrying 1,178 in total barely half the number of passengers on board. However, the crew was unprepared for the emergency having conducted just one lifeboat drill while they were docked at Southampton, and even this consisted of lowering just two lifeboats into the water. No further lifeboat drills had been conducted since the Titanic left Southampton. Unprepared and lack of training meant very few of the crew knew what they were supposed to do. Since they were not trained, seamen and thus had no experience. Rowing a boat the first-class passengers were dealt with first since they were seen as the most important. However, the second- and third-class passengers were furious, frantic and scared, and pushed through the barriers that the stewards had put in place to keep them trapped while they dealt with the first-class passengers above. Therefore, the boat deck became packed with passengers from all classes, and the resulting scramble was almost impossible to control. Captain Smith ordered that second officer Lytoller and Murdoch to put the women and children in and lower away. Lytoller took control of the port side boats while Murdoch commandeered the starboard boats. They both misinterpreted Captain Smith's orders. Lytoller took it to mean women and children only. Murdoch understood it as meaning women and children first. Lytoller failed to fill the boats to capacity leaving empty seats where men could have Saturday only allowed a limited number of men to board if all the women and children nearby had been transferred over. If all 20 boats were filled to their capacity, then an additional 500 passengers could have been saved. The final lifeboat that was launched was Collapsible D, which departed from the Titanic at 2.05 a.m. with just 25 passengers aboard. Captain Smith conducted a final tour of the deck before walking onto the bridge just as the ship took its final plunge. It's thought that he died there, as it was customary for every captain to go down with their ship. Titanic goes under by around 2.15 a.m. Enough water had begun to pour into areas that had not yet been flooded at an increasingly rapid rate. This caused the Titanic's bow to become fully submerged in the water which, in turn, caused the stern to rise to an angle of 30 to 35 degrees. After some minutes, the ship's interior lights flickered before going out completely, plummeting the ship into total darkness. The Titanic stayed there for a few moments, appended in the water, only bobbing occasionally. However, the ship was being pulled apart by opposing forces. The flooded bow was being pulled down while her uplifted stern kept her at the water's surface. Not long after the ship's lights went out, 
the ship split into two. The bow flooded rapidly, causing it to tilt completely upright before splitting from the stern completely and sinking down to the bottom of the sea while the stern bobbed on the surface for a few moments longer. At around 2.20 a.m., two hours and 40 minutes after the collision, the Titanic finally descended, leaving a trail of machinery, coal, and debris in its wake. The entire ship vanished from view within six minutes, before landing in its final resting place at the bottom of the ocean. Survivors recoup on the SS Carpathia. Out of the 2,224 passengers aboard the RMS Titanic, 1,500 passengers were not lucky enough to find their place in any of the 20 lifeboats that were used and thus later passed away in the freezing conditions. Only 360 bodies were later found. The remaining 705 passengers that survived found their way onto the lifeboats and were transported from the wreckage. These survivors were rescued by the SS Carpathia at around 4 a.m. on the 15th of April, which had steamed through the night at a considerable speed, dodging icebergs en route. Once the Carpathia arrived at the site of the sinking, it took several hours for all the survivors to be brought aboard. During this time, Several of the survivors passed away just before the transfer between the lifeboats and the ship was made. Many of the survivors had to find inventive ways to board the Carpathia from their lifeboats. Some were strong enough to climb up the rope ladders that dangled down the side of the ship. Other adults were hoisted up in slings while the children were hoisted up in mail sacks. The final lifeboat to reach the ship was that of 2nd Officer Charles Lytaller, brimming with over 70 survivors. All the passengers that were rescued were on board the Carpathia by 9 a.m. There was a brief glimpse of joy when families separated by this tragedy were reunited at long last. However, in most cases, many passengers' hopes saddened as their loved ones failed to resurface. Before news of the Titanic's demise had reached the SS Carpathia, the ship was headed for Fjum, Austria-Hungary, now known as Rajika, Croatia. However, with limited medical facilities and the supplies to aid the survivors, Captain Arthur Rostron was to take a different course back to New York where the survivors could be properly looked after. Final thoughts to summarize and conclude, we must ask ourselves, what does this all mean and why was the RMS Titanic doomed to sink from the start? Some would argue that, because the ice warnings given on the day prior to the collision were ignored, this meant that the crew were unable to react and turn the ship accordingly within enough time. This theory is substantiated further by the fact that the binoculars equipped with night vision technology that the outlooks needed were left at Southampton in an accidental mix-up. This left them without the ability to see in the dark, and therefore they were unable to spot the iceberg well ahead of time. Others may argue that the crew themselves were responsible for the collision because they were ill-prepared, unprepared, untrained, and simply ineffective in their posts. The unloading and filling of the lifeboats were chaotic. On the morning of the collision, a second lifeboat drill was scheduled. However, Captain Smith canceled this and it is still unknown why to this day. If he had conducted this lifeboat drill, his crew might have been better prepared to handle such a catastrophic tragedy. And as a result, over 1,500 more souls might have been saved from the wreckage. But what do you make of these titanic facts and discoveries? For many decades, People from around the world have been fascinated by the sightings of a large ape-like creature that's commonly referred to as Bigfoot or Sasquatch. This creature is known for its large stature, with eyewitnesses saying that this large creature stood between 9 and 15 feet tall. Though many might not believe that this creature exists, researchers say there is overwhelming evidence of its presence in mountains and forests from around the world. There are many areas stretching across North America that are often referred to as being hotspots for the sightings of Bigfoot. According to many Bigfoot experts, these concentrated areas get the highest amount of reports of a Sasquatch creature. One headline that surprised many though was just announced by an Oklahoma lawmaker, in which they stated that they wanted to bring in a Bigfoot hunting season. On the 20th of January, Representative Justin Humphrey introduced House Bill 1648, urging the Oklahoma Wildlife Conservation Commission to officially establish a Bigfoot hunting season. The bill stated the following, The Oklahoma Wildlife Conservation Commission shall promulgate rules establishing a Bigfoot hunting season. The commission shall set annual season dates and create any necessary specific hunting licenses and fees. End quote. When this was first announced, 
many online users thought this was a joke. But when people questioned officials on whether this was real or not, Mika Holmes, Assistant Chief of the Information and Education Division at the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation, stated that this is a real bill. Holmes wasn't enthusiastic about the new bill, though, saying the following. Here at the department, we use science to make management decisions, and we do not recognize Bigfoot as a wildlife species in Oklahoma. End quote. At the moment, the bill hasn't passed, but if it does go through, it will take effect on the 1st of November, 2021. Those who are interested in Bigfoot have suggested that this could be the government's way of trying to tell us something with Bigfoot researchers saying that officials are no stranger to the cryptid, and that over the years they have carried out their own investigations into the creature. One Bigfoot researcher said the following, People will laugh about this, but it could be the government's way of telling us that they're out there. Bigfoot has been sighted by man for hundreds of years. We have ancient carvings and stories that have been passed down over generations. Perhaps now the government has decided to tell everyone the truth. As you can imagine, though, not everyone got on board with one person saying the following, it's not a good start, is it? With everything that's currently going on right now, our government has decided it's the right time to bring out a Bigfoot hunting season. I'm glad to know that they're tackling the problems that everyone's talking about. End quote. The Department of Wildlife Conservation went on to hint that it's a bizarre move from the government, with others thinking that at first it was announced in order to give people a laugh. However, after it was announced the bill was genuine, people didn't really know how to react. As of right now, we'll have to wait and see if the bill does eventually get passed. Interestingly, Bigfoot researchers have said the name Bigfoot only describes one type of large humanoid living in the forested regions of our planet. Often encountered in the woods across the United States is that of a cryptid that's commonly been referred to by the locals as the Grassman Monster. The Grassman Monster, also known as Orange Eyes, is a massively large and hairy man-like creature that many have compared to Sasquatch. Unlike many of the other Bigfoot sightings all across the world, it appears that the Grassman cryptid is far more dangerous and has a number of strange behaviors that make it unique across all other Sasquatch species. Many that have claimed to have stumbled across the beast while hiking through forests claim that the Grassman is capable of constructing small huts and areas for living, a unique behavior that's never been reported surrounding that of the Sasquatch species. It's because of this strange behavior that many report that the creature is not that of a Sasquatch, and of a different cryptid entirely. The first well-reported sightings of the Grassman monster happened back in 1978. This was when several kids ran into their home and alerted their grandparents that a hairy man was digging through their rubbish pit. When the grandparents went to investigate what was being claimed, they saw the large grassman as he was digging through the rubbish looking for food. However, the large creatures soon ran away after being spotted by the adults. As research continued in the area surrounding that of the grassman, people began to report spotting a large ape-like creature living in hearts made of tall grass, only to come back to the site later to find it completely abandoned, with the creature moving to new areas after being spotted. Scientists, Researchers and skeptics, though, have turned around and said that there's not enough evidence to prove that these large creatures exist and that the majority of evidence that is presented ends up getting debunked. Some evidence that has been put forward to prove that Bigfoot is real is that of hair samples. However, when scientists have tested these, the majority of them turned out to be from everyday wildlife. This hasn't stopped Bigfoot researchers, though. As they say, there's enough proof and eye when it's accounts that have led them to believe that the Bigfoot creature is real. Saying that one of the main reasons why they're not spotted is because they congregate in dense forests that are hard to reach. They say this is one of the main reasons why hikers are more likely to see the creatures than others, because they're more likely to venture into these regions. Although these claims and stories seem far-fetched, it's important to remember that animals such as the mountain gorilla were only discovered in 1902 with scientists saying that thousands of new species are still being discovered every year. As of right now, Bigfoot researchers have said these creatures are out there, and in recent years credible photographs have been presented which prove that humans currently share the planet with a large undiscovered humanoid. So what do you guys make of the news that the government is trying to establish a Bigfoot hunting season? And what do you make of the creature itself? Do you think it's real? Or are people just misidentifying everyday wildlife?
Images are so much more than a click of a button or the flash of a lens. Images are memories, records, evidence, documentation, and so much more. They remind us of the good times, the bad times, and everything in between. Some images are world famous and others are most definitely not for everybody to see. But there are also images in which time literally stands still. Images that define generations, events, people, and the world as we know it. Some of the most famous photos that exist today include lunch atop a skyscraper taken in 1932. It shows a group of builders sitting high above New York on a solid tube steel beam belonging to a partially built Rockefeller Center. Another is far more tragic. The shocking yet incredible mushroom cloud of the Nagasaki atomic bomb drop. Taken by Lieutenant Charles Levy in 1945. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at three rare historical images, ones that have not been as widely circulated. The last picture of Nikola Tesla, 1943. Nikola Tesla is best known for his contributions to the understanding and design of the modern AC alternating current system. This current flow is the sort found in homes, powering toasters, fridges, TVs, and many more. It's used in homes as it can be brought down to a safe enough voltage for domestic use. Tesla was a fascinating man, who met a rather sorry end. He was known to have experienced financial troubles in his later years, never married, and had a peculiar love for birds. In fact, he was known to feed them and nurse injured ones from the window of his room at New York's Waldorf Astoria Hotel. He didn't own a house for much of his adult life, but rather moved from luxury hotel to luxury hotel, racking up rather large bills as he went. This contributed to Tesla's financial issues and by the time he passed away in 1943, it's rumored that he was broke. Tesla was also a vegetarian and allegedly lived on only milk, bread, honey, and vegetable juices towards the end of his life. His vegetarianism was likely part of the reason he was so slim. In fact, from 1888 to 1926, Tesla allegedly didn't lose or put on even a kilogram of weight. Tesla's last photo is somewhat haunting. It shows a brilliant man who's been condemned to old age. Whilst Tesla's mind may have remained sharp, his appearance was weak. His cheeks were thin and bony, with only sparse hair on his head. He would have been 86 at the time of the photo, taken the same year he passed away. Given that Tesla passed on January 7, 1943, it's likely this photo was taken within days of his passing. The last photo of one of science's greatest men. Tesla's work is world-renowned and his patents would have been worth billions. Vladimir Lenin's last photo Vladimir Lenin, real name Vladimir Yulianov, was the revolutionary Russian leader of the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. He also set up the Russian Communist Party and contributed heavily to the building of the Soviet state. In other words, Lenin was an influential and extremely powerful man. To put all that information into context, we need to talk briefly about Russia in the early 20th century. Before 1917, Russia was ruled solely by Tsar Nicholas II. He was essentially the king of Russia, but was wildly corrupt, and the public and government were hugely divided in Russia. Tensions rose, and a year before World War I finished in 1917, a faction of far-left disgruntled workers led by Vladimir Lenin, called the Bolsheviks, revolted against the Tsar and his government. Some scholars view Lenin as the greatest revolutionary in history, and his ideological stance known as Leninism, along with Karl Marx, has founded much of modern communist political thought. Between 1917 and 1924, Lenin oversaw sweeping economy reform in Russia, nationalizing private industries and turning the country into the ideal communist state. His health deteriorated in the 1920s, and he allegedly even asked Joseph Stalin to source a highly toxic chemical compound for him so he could end his own life. At great expense, Lenin reportedly hired 26 doctors to look after him in his final years. The leader suffered a series of strokes in the 1920s, but doctors couldn't quite work out what the underlying cause was. Nonetheless, Lenin carried on living a somewhat public life and denounced Joseph Stalin's suitability as general secretary of the Communist Party in 1923. He recommended fellow statesman Leon Trotsky for the job. Trotsky would never take office and was expelled from the Soviet Union later during Stalin's rule. Lenin's last photo shows him in a wheelchair, looking somewhat perplexed. By the time the photo was taken, 
he'd suffered three strokes and completely lost the ability to speak. Standing beside him is his sister and one of his doctors. The photo shows a great statesman and revolutionary, depending on your perspective, reduced to nothing more than a senile man in his last days. The last photo of the Titanic afloat, 1912. The legendary, tragic fate of the RMS Titanic remains the worst cruise ship disaster ever. The Titanic was horrific. It was the product of naive design, with too few lifeboats provided to cater for the ship's capacity. Although the ship's builders never actually said the ship was unsinkable, the idea played into the build somewhere. There are several conspiracy theories surrounding the Titanic. Some are wacky, some are wondrous, and some have a teeny tiny bit of credibility to them. They include literature foreshadowing the sinking, a third ship being within miles of the Titanic the night she sank, and the conspiracy that the ship was cursed. Alongside these conspiracies, there are also common misconceptions surrounding the sinking of the Titanic. Now nearly everyone has seen the drawings of the Titanic, snapped in half as she dramatically before plunging into the deep, dark Atlantic. Her lights began to flicker and slowly went black one by one. As freezing water flooded each cabin, kitchen, boiler room, a bar, and every human that nobly went down. However, these drawings are just that, merely drawings. Titanic's photographic memory is simply a black and white picture of the great ship heading out to the ocean, where she'd meet a cold and dark fate. Her last photo was taken by the Irish priest Francis Brown, who sailed with the ship for the first leg of its journey, from Southampton to Queenstown. Luckily, he later disembarked. From a great inventor to a famous revolutionary to a mighty ship moving slowly out to the ocean, Photos have recorded invaluable pieces of history that cannot quite be portrayed to such a real extent. Next time you take the ability to take a picture on your phone for granted, remember that you're capturing a little piece of history every day. As early as 100 years ago, it wasn't even possible to capture some of our world's most incredible moments with such ease. So what do you make of these rare historical images? The natural satellite orbiting our planet Earth might be little more than a pretty object to look at in the sky to some, while others may track the moon's phases compulsively. Whilst we often aim to explore as far out into the universe as we possibly can, there is still plenty to discover and explore a little closer to home. From the first moon landing in 1969 to the most recent findings, there is still plenty we are uncovering about our moon. So today we'll be taking a look at three moon mysteries and discoveries. Impact Crater Mysteries Our moon features a gigantic crater. This hole has been on our moon for billions of years, since an unknown object hit the dark side of the moon. We have measured this crater to reach 1,550 miles in width and 8 miles in depth, and so have dubbed it one of the largest craters within our solar system. The presumed explanation for decades was simply that this crater was formed when contact was made between the moon and a rapidly paced meteor. If this had been the case, then there would be pieces from the inside of the moon on the surface possibly available to examine. Some new insight was provided in January 2019, when the U-2 rover was sent to the moon from China, which reached the bottom of this mysterious crater, which appear to have come from within the moon's mantle. In a turn of events, new data came to light within August 2019 from a study published within Geophysical Research Letters. After an analysis was conducted upon the materials found at the bottom of this peculiar crater, it revealed evidence suggesting that the crater was composed entirely of crust, with no mantle. The crust is the outer layer surface of the moon, with the mantle coming just underneath that. This would imply that an object collided with the moon with enough force to open a colossal crater, but with not enough force to release any of the mantle onto the surface of the moon. Co-author of the new study, Xiao Zhang, planetary scientist working at the China University of Geosciences, explained how the team had anticipated finding the mantle materials at this landing site. He goes on to explain that the lack of mantle organisms rules out the possibility that a meteor traveling with high velocity had caused this crater, eliminating an assumption we had been acting upon for decades. This study employed the use of spectroscopy in order to clarify and identify the minerals that had been found within the lunar soil. This process observes how each grain is reflected within both visible and near-infrared light. This study was carried out using the equipment U2-2 was already armed with. Performing these reflection tests on six different areas of soil, 
ranging up to approximately 175 feet away from the landing site. An already established database allowed each mineral to be identified based upon size, reflectance, and degradation, which often occurs as a result of solar wind. Within every sample, it was evident that the primary mineral in the moon's surface is plagioclase. We know this is common in the crusts of Earth and the moon, but that it isn't likely to be found within the mantle. This mineral composition supports the meteor theory, but then the unanswered question remains as to what created this crater. If it were a meteor, then why aren't there chunks of mantle over the surface? Moon rock given to Holland by Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin turns out to be fake. In 2009, the Dutch National Museum, Rijksmuseum, had a rather bashful announcement to make, with the disappointing revelation that the beloved moon rock is not authentic. While the museum is most well known for fine art exhibitions, one particularly exciting exhibition is Fly Me to the Moon. Front and center in this space-themed piece was what we all thought to be a rock from the moon. This exhibit was first revealed to the public in 2006. The moon rock was intended to symbolize the exploration of far away, distant places, possible colonization and bringing home treasures. The thought, love and excitement represented with this exhibit made the unfortunate reveal of the truth that much more devastating. The rock was gifted to Willem Dries Jr. in 1969 from the U.S. Ambassador to the Netherlands. This gift shortly follows the moon landing. The supposed moon rock was presented from J. William Middendorf II in the midst of a meeting with the famous trio from aboard Apollo 11, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins. When Dries unfortunately passed away in 1998, the rock was donated to the permanent home. A museum spokeswoman explained that, since the rock had come from the personal possession of the Prime Minister, no one had thought to consider checking the authenticity and simply approved the ownership via a phone call with NASA. Apparently, according to the Reeks Museum, the once-believed moon rock had been insured at an estimated half a million dollars, when in reality the value is, at a maximum, worth $70. Former U.S. ambassador attempted to recount the tale, but could not specifically remember how the U.S. State Department acquired the rock at all. It is established and well known that in the 1970s NASA shared lunar rocks with 100 countries. A space expert, however, expressed his shock that the material was already part of an exhibition in just 2006 and so further research began to take place. Free University of Amsterdam's researchers jumped on the case, extensively testing and investigating the genuine history of this rock. Ultimately, the tests proved the rock was not authentic and this lunar adventure keepsake was instead some petrified wood. So far, no one has been able to offer an explanation as to how this scenario could occur. Despite tests proving it's not a moon rock, intend to keep it anyway as a curiosity item, a souvenir to remember this unusual tale, and to keep it home where it belongs. Where did lunar water come from? Our moon has a rather bizarre phenomenon we are still trying to puzzle our way through. There is lunar water on the moon, despite us not being able to observe a water cycle similar to ours on Earth. A recent study has reported clear evidence that there are water molecules on the surface of or held within the grains of the lunar soil. If we can research what kinds of water are available here, and precisely where that water is, then we may be able to fathom out the seemingly magical water cycle of the moon. Another study with groundbreaking revelations found small areas of the moon that are within a permanent shadow. This creates a cold enough environment for ice to form. Additionally, the space of these areas covers 15,400 square miles, according to National Geographic. Current guesses indicate that the water cycle on the moon is carried through hydrogen in solar wind, reacting with oxygen on the surface. This is a stark contrast to our rain, rivers, seawater cycle here on Earth. Other suggestions have guessed that the lunar water travels, migrating to remain in a shadowed zone as opposed to one with sun. Exactly how this happens still requires plenty of further research. Jessica Sunshine, University of Maryland planetary scientist, says that these new findings suggest a more complex process than what we thought before. The practical application once we figure this out would be remarkable. This research has useful implications as to how humans may be able to travel, not only to the moon but further beyond too. The next NASA mission, Artemis, aims to place the first woman and next man on the moon. If we can understand the moon's water cycle before then, 
then we may be able to convert the water into a resource for energy. One trial for the lunar water to withstand is the harsh climate of the moon, with a high of 120 degrees Celsius and a more than chilly low of minus 133 degrees Celsius. It wouldn't be improbable for the water to evaporate, especially without a thick atmosphere. But luckily for us, even in the sun, there are still traces of water, though these are faint. Based upon current observations, there appears to be 12 ounces of lunar water to one cubic meter, meaning the water, whilst existent, is very sparse. This is 100 times drier than the Sahara Desert. Whilst there is water present on the moon, we need to conduct more observations, more analysis, more research before we take action with this thrilling discovery. Once we know a little more about the intricate process, may need to implement some man-made intervention for this water to be of use due to its limited supply. This research is being referred to by some as the slow revolution. Whilst new progress is being made and we are slowly beginning to make a clearer picture, but the tedious process could still take decades of more research. Researchers completing this project report that despite having a difficult job, the work is very rewarding and know that the findings will be worthwhile. Whilst there are so many unanswered questions out in the universe, some of the more interesting ones begin much closer to home. Between unanswered questions and thrilling new research, our moon has a lot of exciting news going on at the moment. But what do you make of these moon mysteries and discoveries? No historical place name quite sends shivers down the spine like Atlantis. The fabled city that sunk to the bottom of the Mediterranean has intrigued scholars, academics, and even conspiracy theorists for hundreds of years. But is there more to the story of Atlantis than meets the eye? So today we'll be taking a look at three stories about the underwater world. See if we can piece together the Atlantis mystery. The Atlantis alloy. Off the coast of Sicily, multiple sites of shipwrecks have nestled some of the most incredible archaeological finds in recent years. Ingots colored in the most dazzling gold color were found along the seabed at the site of a crash from nearly 2,600 years ago. Some believe that these ingots may be made from the same precious materials described to belong in abundance across the mythical island of Atlantis. In 2015, divers discovered a total of 39 ingots among a Sicilian shipwreck. These were composed of copper, zinc, and charcoal, and all of them had a shiny, brassy finish. Some believe that this discovery was evidence of the existence of orocalcum. In the more recent discovery in 2017, with 47 of the same ingots, had scientists pondering of the same thing. This more recent shipwreck was discovered in the proximity of two other wrecks, roughly a thousand feet off the coast of Sicily. Believed to have been submerged during a storm, the ships were found beneath roughly 10 feet of water. In Plato's Critias Dialogue, he describes the rarity of this ingot, stating that the only more precious material was gold. As the ancient Greek philosopher might have believed, the history and existence of orocalcum has been in question for centuries. The very first historical mention of orocalcum is in the 7th century BC by an ancient Greek poet. Still, despite historical literature, no sizable quantity of orocalcum was found until the 2015 discovery. Speaking of the discovery, an assistant to Sicily's superintendent of the seas said within the waters, there were a priceless mine of archaeological finds. Plato said that orocalcum was abundant in the opulence of Atlantis, specifically decorating the entirety of Poseidon's temple. He stated that the outermost wall was coated with brass, the second with tin, and the third which was the wall of citadel, flashed with the bright red light of orocalcum. The discovery of the rare alloy is not too surprising. The city was an affluent place during ancient Greece. Experts believe that the orocalcum ingots that were recently discovered would have been the works of craftsmen and workshops in order to be turned into valuable and fashionable goods. Could this discovery suggest there was more to the Atlantis story than just the myth? Will these ingots part of an ancient material that Atlantis use in abundance? A hidden world. When Plato described the Atlantis was banished beneath the waves by the gods, Many took the event as pure fiction, mythological poetry. But what if we said that sinking continents is a real thing, and more than just ancient fiction? Recent research has highlighted a number of sunken and lost continents in Europe. 
they managed to shape a massive part of human history. In September 2019, a Dutch geologist helped to publish a paper of research surrounding the lost continent. By studying geological features across the Mediterranean Sea, the team of researchers were able to piece together the size of a long-forgotten continent that has been missing for millions of years. The team of researchers stated it's enormous about the size and rough shape of Greenland. But Greater Adria's plight was not as simple as what Plato described the fell on Atlantis. Instead of sinking beneath the waves, Greater Adria was crushed between what is now southern Europe and the ancient continent now rests completely under the surface. Research also shows that the story is by far from unique. In fact, research surrounding the Earth's mantle shows evidence of many lost continents, with many of Earth's early life being lost as well. It's a strange coincidence of fate. The very story that he invented. Perhaps stories and tales of lost cities began from the sinking of lost continents, passed down information sculpting what would become folklore and mythology. The crust and debris left by Greater Adria was coincidentally also composed to form marble across the Mediterranean and local regions. The ancient Greeks and Romans used this in abundance to decorate and construct their temples. But what if we told you that there's a lost continent? That was lost to sea. While the details may not perfectly align with Plato's description of Atlantis, the formation, known as Zealandia, seemed to have suffered a similar fate to the mythological city. While New Zealand might be seen as a small island, lying in the shadow of its big cousin Australia, research actually suggests that New Zealand is much more than an island, but belongs to a large geographical structure, Earth's so-called Eighth Continent. In 2017, Research conducted by Nick Mortimer of GNS Science, a geological research company, and Rupert Sutherland of Victoria University Wellington found that by combing ocean floor data surrounding New Zealand with measurements of surface gravity and analysis of seafloor samples, New Zealand is much more than meets the eye. In fact, the total Zealandia measured to be about two-thirds the size of Australia. Zealandia shows how the continents have altered and changed over millions of years. During the time when dinosaurs walked the Earth, Zealandia was part of the supercontinent Gondwana. Then it got separated 85 to 100 million years ago. It got stretched and thinned, resulting in a lower elevation, and it was also affected by the development of the Pacific Ring of Fire, a zone of volcanic activity that rims the Pacific Ocean, stated Sutherland. Much like Atlantis, Zealandia inevitably sank beneath the waves. Today, the only remaining part of Zealandia that exists above water are the islands of New Zealand and New Caledonia. With this discovery, perhaps the story of Atlantis is a little more realistic than we first thought. Atlantis would be at least 11,500 years old. The ancient nature of Plato's iconic text discussing Atlantis means that many finer details, be them historical or scientific, have been lost to time. Accuracy in reporting isn't always precise when discussing ancient texts. They're often marked with accidental or sometimes intentional mistakes in historical fact. But what if we were to treat the Atlantis myth as fact? Could a kind of advanced supercity like that described by Plato truly exist? In 2019, an open-source research paper discusses the historical accuracy behind the idea of Atlantis, titled Atlantis, a grain of truth behind the fiction. It goes into detail on how Atlantis, or at least the idea of Atlantis may have come about, discussing how the Atlantean temple likely derived from natural events that were expanded upon over time, and flourish with extra detail, specifically saying, Plato's tale might contain references to actual events, even though artfully retouched. The paper goes on to discuss how the Egyptians, the go-to ancient civilization for the time when Plato was writing, also had similar tales of lost civilizations. Despite the ancient Egyptians being seen as one of the oldest and most well-established, they had various myths and folk laws to explain how gods had come from lost lands and transformed their way of living with introductions of technologies and agriculture. This could mean that Atlantis, as written by Plato, could be referring to the same place that Egypt's founders came from. Looking at archaeological and geological evidence, the research paper suggests the myth of Atlantis was likely formed by actual geological events, but was adopted passed down and shaped into what we know today. As Atlantis, besides the unexpected rise in temperature resulting in an increase in sea level, the period was also marked by the birth of agriculture and the appearance of totally new technologies in diverse Near Eastern locations. 
All of these point to the theory that actual events during this period of history eventually became a way of explaining the world through myths and stories eventually being utilized by Plato to popularize his beliefs. The memory of these events would have been passed down through the myth of the foundation of Egypt, and through this to Greek culture, enabling Plato to overemphasize the antiquity of his noble ancestors, while embellishing the characteristics of the invaders. While there's no evidence besides that found in the Near East, the research paper goes on to argue that the possible discovery of obsidian submerged in the flooded islands in the Strait of Sicily suggests that there was certainly a technological advancement made around the supposed time of Atlantis' existence, again helping to form the idea of an advanced ancient society. So what do you make of these mysteries and discoveries surrounding Atlantis? Mexico is a fascinating country. It's home to some of the most incredible monuments on our planet and some of these belong to the Mayan civilization. When we think about pyramids, many of us will immediately think of the Great Pyramids of Giza, structures that have for years created debate among archaeologists and researchers. However, the argument could be made that some of the most impressive pyramids actually belong to the Mayan people. Various civilizations like the Mayan Aztec and Olmec built impressive pyramid-like structures some of which are still being uncovered today in dense jungle regions. It's incredible to think that such large structures have gone undetected for so long. It just goes to show that we still have a lot to uncover and learn about in regards to our ancestors. Maya and other ancient ruins have intrigued people for years. Archaeological evidence has shown us that this civilization started to build their structures around 3,000 years ago, and every year archaeologists and researchers are able to uncover various treasures from these locations helping us to better understand their way of life. Interestingly though, in recent years a number of amateur finds have been presented which seem to suggest that these ancient civilizations may have had help. I've recently covered this topic in a previous video. But since then, various discoveries have been made, in which amateur archaeologists said they discovered strange artifacts close to these sites. As of right now, professionals have criticized these amateurs by saying they could be damaging the region and that they shouldn't be removing things without having permission. Further saying that these discoveries do not match up with other artifacts that are found in the region. They say they don't like amateurs digging in the region because it can mess up their records. Saying that they like to keep a close eye on what comes out of the region and this helps them piece together what was going on thousands of years ago. When you start removing artifacts, it makes it harder to track what's going on. Regardless, various amateur archaeologists have taken it upon themselves to dig in these regions in the hopes of finding ancient treasures, and in some cases amateurs have claimed to have stumbled across artifacts they didn't expect to find. These can go for big money in underground markets, and are big enough incentives for these amateur diggers to risk getting caught. One interesting discovery that was recently made, however, started to raise eyebrows. And this is because the artifacts in question didn't resemble a human, but rather that of an extraterrestrial. The artifacts were published to various online groups, stating that amateur diggers had found an underground complex that had many of these strange artifacts. It's said that one of the first people to have discovered these was a man back in March of 2017, and he detailed that he discovered them inside an underground cave complex close to Veracruz. One of the first things you'll notice about these artifacts is that they don't seem to match typical discoveries made in this region. Various different images were published online and many of these show what looked like UFOs and extraterrestrials, causing some to question whether more of these artifacts had been discovered. And are we being kept in the dark about them? As mentioned before though, information on these finds are limited, but the amateur archaeologists have said they were digging in the region when they made their finds. One researcher who allegedly has ties to these amateurs has said they don't want to give away too much information about where they're digging. One, because it will help them get caught by authorities, and secondly, because they don't want people to know about the spot where they found these artifacts, as they hope to return and find more. One of these amateur archaeologists have said there's a lot to these underground chambers that haven't been excavated by archaeologists, and that inside them you will occasionally find these strange artifacts. Others who've seen these have said that perhaps others have been found by mainstream researchers, but aren't being shared with the public. Others carried on from this and said that every so often these strange artifacts will come to light, and that the amateur researchers who found them are usually silenced before they can come forward with their discoveries. It's for this reason that some have suggested that something may be going on in this region, 
and that officials don't want these discoveries being shown to the general population. Some of these amateur researchers have said they were approached by supposed archaeologists in the region and asked whether they could take their artifacts and get them tested. When the amateur diggers handed over the items, though, they said they never saw them again. And when they tried to contact those who took their artifacts, they were unable to reach anyone or get an answer for what happened to them. Researchers have said that recent discoveries only give us a small glimpse into our history, going on to say that over 98% of our ancient history has been lost. Ancient carvings and structures can give us an idea of what certain civilizations were capable of, and there's some within the archaeological community that disagree of how advanced certain cultures were. Following on from these images, similar-looking photographs were shared to ancient archaeological groups, once again claiming that amateur archaeologists found these artifacts while digging. One report states that the artifacts were discovered during the building of the mine train. Currently construction work is underway to build a large railway in Mexico. The construction began in December in 2018, with various people coming forward and saying that strange discoveries have been made in the area. These mysterious artifacts were discovered in a region known as Quintana Roo. There's no other way to describe these artifacts other than they look like extraterrestrials, possessing big eyes, a large oval head and just matching the overall shape of a gray alien. This has had social media users convinced that these are the real deal. Not everyone was so impressed with the findings, though, with one Mexican archaeologist saying that these are fakes, and that although they were allegedly found with other Mayan artifacts, it's thought they were placed here in order to make the findings seem more genuine. So what do you make of these mysterious artifacts found in Mexico? Do you think they're real? Or do you think they're just fakes? Reports of paranormal entities have been shared for centuries, but it's not just the general public that have allegedly encountered these apparitions. The police are the first emergency service we call when our lives or property are at risk. Dealing with things like break-ins or driving offenses are pretty much routine occurrences for them. So when the police see something not even they can explain, it's understandable that we all begin to feel a little uneasy. Even the most experienced officers have on some occasions been truly baffled by the weird, or in some cases, altogether disturbing things they've experienced. The Bexhill Police Station in Sussex has been at the center of a strange haunting. Police officers and others who have visited the station have reported seeing a gentleman, saying that every so often this figure will make himself known, and say that he looks to be from the Edwardian era. One of the officers working at the station said this figure has allegedly been seen on the grounds for hundreds of years and thinks that perhaps something may have happened hundreds of years ago that caused the apparition to stick around. Those that have seen him, though, have said he doesn't seem to have a motive and most of the time he can be seen walking throughout the station almost as if he's lost or looking for something. The next station that's said to have an unearthly visitor is that of the Birmingham Police Station on Canterbury Road. Officers working here would detail that during the night shift they kept hearing strange sounds. As they walked around the building in order to find out what was making the strange noises, they would see a misty manifestation appear in front of them or behind them. The few officers that saw the apparition claim that it appeared to be a woman. This matches up with the descriptions given by various officers that heard the sounds. Employees who worked the night shift claimed to have heard loud screams that echoed throughout the building saying that sometimes they were alone when this happened. This strange event had been happening since the early 1970s and continued until the building was eventually closed. Because of this, many officers refused to work the night shift. The building was eventually investigated, saying that the strange noises that could be heard were being made by the building itself because of how old it was. But those who worked there said this was just an excuse that was made up in order to make them feel better and doesn't explain the loud screams and apparitions that were heard and seen by many of the officers. Blackburn Police Station in Lancashire is another location said to be haunted. Since 1999, cleaning staff and officers have reported seeing an apparition throughout the building, going on to note that this figure appears to be a tall man that wears a top hat. Those that have seen him have said he looks to be from the Victorian era and that it's hard to make out certain features, but one of the things that stands out is his hands. Due to these descriptions, it's caused some to speculate that what people are seeing is an entity that's become known as the Hapma. The history of the Hatman phenomenon goes way back in time, and different written records of the Hatman have been found. In fact, 
Some evidence of the hat man-like entity had been found in scriptures of previous civilizations, showcasing that whatever this thing is, it's been plaguing humanity for a long time. Some have gone on to detail that this entity would appear in the corner of a room while they were sleeping, and that when they tried to move or get away from it, they realized they can't. This has caused some to say that this entity is evil. Some people believe that Hapman is actually a mysterious paranormal entity that's haunted human beings for years and continues to do so in the present day. They believe that Hapman tries its best to paralyze a person and even take their life. However, when it fails to do so, the person lives to tell the tale. Those at the station have said this manifestation usually makes itself known at night, with many of the cleaners coming forward and detailing that they saw a tall man with a hat on during their shift, which frightened them so much that they handed in their notice the next day. This in turn means that the station has a high turnaround of cleaners, as those who have seen or heard something end up leaving soon after, saying that whatever they saw was unlike anything they've experienced. It's not known why this entity is seen by so many people, but if you ask those that have experienced the paranormal, many of them will say that they have encountered a shadow person. This shadowy figure has over time become famous, leading on to it being given a variety of different names, some of which include the shadow man, the hat man, and the shadow person. The phenomenon has gained widespread popularity and a number of documentaries have been made on the subject, trying to get to the bottom of what people are experiencing. However, it seems the more the subject is looked into, the more questions that are put forward. People have been encountering this paranormal entity for years, which has caused paranormal researchers to put forward different theories for why so many people see this apparition. According to one theory, humans are most vulnerable when they're asleep. And when they're suffering from sleep paralysis, their brain plays this trick where they believe that someone is ready to harm them. However, there is no scientific evidence supporting this theory. Some people believe that Haltman is actually their own spirit and that it appears as a shadowy figure. One chilling story was told by a woman who said that she saw one of these shadow figures crawling up her bed. She claims that she closed her eyes and upon opening them it vanished. But as she looked up to the ceiling she said it was hanging upside down. A hollow raspy voice then said they were marked. And then it vanished. There are various places across our planet that you'd think are more likely to be haunted than others. Some of these including things like cemeteries, old buildings, and places that have seen dark times. But one place where you wouldn't expect there to be apparitions is that of police stations. However, eyewitness reports show this isn't the case. As many officers and employees have come forward in detail at their strange encounters. So what do you make of these haunted police stations? And have you ever seen anything similar?